All right, we're at the top of the hour. I'd like to say good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for joining us. And, behalf of, and on behalf of your Baird Financial Advisor, I'd like to welcome you to this month's Baird Wall Strategies webinar. We're Jeanette Hain, Education Planning Consultant, and Chris Dolan, Senior Financial Planner, plan to discuss how current pandemic, how the current pandemic could affect the college experience, college costs, and education planning going forward. Before I turn the call over to, to Jeanette and Chris, I'd like to share some background on each of them. As Baird's educational planning consultant, Jeanette has a deep knowledge within the 529 and educational planning space. She partners closely with our financial advisors to advise clients and prospects on the benefits of 529s, education planning, and how to utilize these situations based on client goals. To stay current within the industry um, as it relates to 529s, she maintains great relationships with 529 program managers and industry, industry peers to provide further tools, resources, and ideas to the field. While not at work, Jeanette and her husband, Scott, and two sons enjoy camping. Then transitioning to Chris Dolan. Chris's areas of expertise include financial planning, retirement income plans, Medicare, and Social Security. He also serves in a training role for our financial advisors, helping them incorporate financial planning into their practice and using tools Baird has available to create meaningful, meaningful proposals to their clients. Chris earned his bachelor's degree in Spanish from Brigham Young University. Chris has attended the University of Washington and graduated with a master's, master's degree of business administration with an emphasis in investment finance. Passing the national board exam, Chris became a certified financial planner and a member of the Puget Sound chapter of the Financial Planning Association. While not at work, Chris has found playing it can be found playing catch with the sons or diving his, driving his daughters to ballroom dance competitions. Chris and Jeanette, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you for having us. Happy to be here. Well, before we turn the call over to each of you, um, I just have a few housekeeping items I want to highlight. So for optimal viewing, we suggest turning your layout to the side-by-side -side view and that can be done via the circle in the upper right-hand corner. All participants are in listen-only mode, but we'd love to hear from you. We will host a Q&A session at the end of today's session um, and address, address as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question by clicking the Q&A icon on the bottom right-hand side of your screen and address, the, address your question to all panelists. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available via your financial advisor about a week following the call. So with that said, Jeanette, if you're ready to take the stage, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Kelsey. And everyone, welcome. Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules and listening in on this webinar. I really will think you'll find this uh, very impactful and hopefully you'll have some key takeaways on education, planning, financial aid, and then what is happening um, currently in this new environment. So thank you. Again, I'm Jeanette Hain. I'm the education planning consultant here at Baird. I've been at Baird for 16 years in the education planning space for 13 years. I have two sons. Uh, my, my oldest is 10. Um, my youngest is seven, uh, Connor and Camden. My husband and my family, I reside in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. So uh, happy to be here. A little bit about Baird. Uh, Baird is privately held and employee owned. We're really unique. A lot of Baird associates even have Baird stock. So we're invested back into Baird. We were founded in 1919. So we're over 100 years old. We celebrated 100 year anniversary a couple of years ago. Our mission is to provide the best financial advice and service to our clients and be the best place to work for our associates. We've been on the 100 best companies to work for Fortune 100 for two, since 2004, and then we were celebrating this year as well. We have about 4,600 4, associates and over 200 locations in the US, Europe, and Asia. So let's get started. What are we gonna talk about today? Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll come away some, with some thoughtful uh, things to think about uh, for now in the future. We're gonna first of all talk about the cost of college. We have to talk about it. We have to talk about today's costs and what it's gonna look like in the future, especially during this uh, current pandemic. We're gonna talk about all the different ways to save for college. I don't know about you, but when I invest in a product or invest in something, I wanna know all my options, right? 
Then we're going to talk about what is a 529. We are going to put a big focus on 529s because they have a lot of tax advantages and tax benefits compared to other vehicles. We're going to talk about how COVID may be impacting your education plan now and in the future. How the Biden administration proposals may be impacting your education plans. Unless you've been living under a rock, there's a lot of new things coming out from Washington, D.C., and we have to keep on top of that. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up and talk about what you need to know about the financial aid process. And then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Chris Dolan, who's going to go even to more detail about that and other things that's happening in Washington, D.C. So with this, this is my, my favorite slide. Um, you know, it's a real life scenario. Here are four children. They don't have a worry in the world. They're sitting on the pier, they're fishing, but parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, we're always worried about their children. And you'll, you'll see these little dollar signs on top of their heads. Kids are expenses. Expensive, I know, I have two myself. So let's take a look at these four children. Let's take a look at the youngest here. He's, he's in yellow. He's about five years old. Now, the current um, average cost of college at a typical four-year in-state school to pay for room and board, tuition, and some fees is at around $22,000. That's the national average. Now, project that in the future. So when this five-year-old becomes 18, he's ready for college. Now, college could cost him up to $136,000 to attend all four years at a typical in-state public institution. Now, let's look at the oldest. The oldest, we're going to say, is the, the girl in the blue sweatshirt. She's 16 years old. She's two years away from college. Current cost right now is $22,000 a year. Now, project that two years from now. For four years, it's going to cost you $98,000. Now, how did I get that? So we have some really great college cost calculators that your Baird Financial Advisor can run for you. The current rate of college cost increasing is about 3% each year. That is higher than the rate of inflation. So something to keep in mind. Now, if you add all, all of this up, all four price tags, that's about half a million dollars, $467,000. Now, this is sticker price. So, of course, there's financial aid help. There's scholarships. You can kind of negotiate on each college. Each college is going to have a different cost, right? But we like to talk to our clients and our associates here at Bayer that, you know what, it could cost, if you have four children, $467,000 for public schools. Now, let's go to the next slide and take a look at private schools. This is going to be double the cost, a little scary. So, you know what, um, my child isn't going to go to UW-Madison, which is our in-state school here. You know what, they're, they're going to go to Harvard. They have their, their, their heart set on Harvard. Yikes, that's every parent's kind of dream and nightmare at the same time. So look at all these. This is double the cost. So for that same five-year-old in the future, when he turns 18, to go to a private school, that could, could cost you $311,000. Add all those price tags together, that's close to a million dollars. Currently, right now, the cost of private colleges, the national average, is around $50,000 a year. So project that using a 3% college cost inflation. This is what you could possibly get. So again, not to scare you, but just to put it in perspective. So this leads into what are all the different ways to save for education? We are going to focus today on 529 College Savings Plan. Like I mentioned earlier, it has a lot of tax savings advantages, and we're going to speak on that in a future slide. And just be aware, you can use 529 College Savings Plan for higher education, but now due to a recent act, you can use it for K through 12 tuition up to $10,000 a year. Now, there may be state tax implications, but in the federal level, it'll come out federally tax free. And this is where your Baird Financial Advisor and the advisor can work with me or Chris can have a more deeper conversation and look at, you know, state by state. Now, 529s grow tax deferred, come out tax free, like I said, if used towards a uh, qualified higher education expense towards an eligible ins institution. What is an eligible institution? That's typically your four year, two year public, private, in state, out of state, vocational, and trade schools around the US and some foreign institutions. 
And then K through 12 is your typical private public institution. And you can withdraw up to $10,000 to pay for tuition only for K through 12. We'll go over what, uh, what are considered qualified higher education expenses in a future slide. So prepaid tuition plans, what are those? So it's unlike a 529 college savings plan, prepaid is built like a contract. You're locked in for today's prices for the future, but we don't know what the future college cost is really gonna be, right? So these aren't as popular as the 529 college savings plan across the industry. Uh, prepaid tuition plans, there's only a handful out there that the states offer. I think there's around under 15 currently right now. You can only use those funds to pay for tuition. It's called units or credit, so it doesn't cover those other costs of college like computer technology, um, room and board, fees and books. And also, you may only be able to use it in your in-state colleges. I don't know about you, but for my, my seven-year-old at least, I don't know if he dreams to go to Harvard or to UW-Madison. We're not really sure at this age where they're gonna go, right? So those are just vehicles to think about. Assets not specific to college. You have your Coverdells, your, your custodial accounts, US savings bonds and insurance policies. Yes, that could be used for education, but they may not be as flexible or have as many tax savings as the other vehicles like 529 college savings plans. Coverdells has income restrictions, so some of you may not even qualify. You can only contribute $2,000 a year. There's age restrictions. At age 30, you have to deplete the account or turn it over to the beneficiary. So there's some restrictions right there. Custodial accounts. Those are good in, in some ways where you can really gift anything to a minor. So UTMA is Uniform Transfers to Minors Act. So grandparents like to use this, parents like to use this. You can use that money to spend down on anything that benefits the child above and beyond your typical food, clothing, and, and shelter for the child. So like new braces, higher education, going to camp. However, at age of termination, depending on the state, 18 or 21, it, it varies per state, you have to turn over those assets to that minor when they're adult and they can do with anything they want with it. So I don't know about you. I don't know if I'm going to trust my, my Connor when he's 21 years old. Is he going to buy a sports car or is he going to use it to pay um, either off his student debt or pay towards his education? We don't know. So 529 College Savings Plan is really earmarked towards higher education. There's U.S. savings bonds. You typically you don't have a lot of return from those insurance policies but there's some downsides. It could affect your financial aid eligibility. Other methods include, you know, if you search on the internet, you can use five or um, to save for education, you can use Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs, home equity. Again, Roth IRA may affect your financial aid eligibility. Traditional IRAs doesn't really make sense from a tax saving standpoint and home equity. Again, this is if your main goal is to save for education planning. So I just want to throw that out there and really mention all the different vehicles that can be used for education. Education. So with that, we're going to focus on 529 College Savings Plan, like I promised. So again, it's a qualified tuition program under a tax code. That's why they call it Section 529. It's Section 529 of the Internal Revenue Code. Now, you're basically invested in mutual funds, so you are invested in the market. Um, there's many state 529 plans out there. There's close to 90 college savings plans to choose from. We have 28 of those on our platform here at Baird, so your financial advisor can help you select the best plan for you and your family because some states have state tax benefits, such as Wisconsin. So if I'm a Wisconsin resident, contribute to the Wisconsin College Savings Plan. Wisconsin, Wisconsin actually has two. I can deduct from my Wisconsin taxable income up to a certain dollar amount every year I contribute. So there's a state tax savings, right? Now, like I mentioned earlier, you can spend these assets down on any eligible institution, which is really any institution that participates in the federal financial aid program, which is your four-year, two-year public, private, traditional, uh, vocational and trade schools. Now, I get a lot of questions all day long from our financial advisors and our clients. Can I use money 
to pay for transportation to fly my child to and from, you know, from spring break or back home during winter break? And the answer is no, you can't use 529 money for everything, but you can use it for a lot. So tuition, mandatory fees, that's where it's gonna be the heaviest cost, right? Room and board. If you're attending at least half time, you're considered a half time student. Uh, book supplies, equipment required for enrollment, computer technology that was recently passed in 2015. K through 12 tuition. Uh, be mindful of your, your state taxes, but it does come out federally tax free and most states it comes out state tax free. There's a limit though. You can only spend it on $10,000 of tuition only uh, per year per beneficiary. You can spend it down on fees, books, supplies, equipment for apprenticeship programs. That was just recently passed in 2019. And now you can pay off your student loan debt up to $10,000 and for a sibling, a brother and sister. Again, that's a lifetime total of $10,000. So if you did graduate and you have some debt and grandma and grandpa forgot to tell you that they have a 529 college savings plan saved for you, you can use some of that money to pay down student loan debt. So there's a lot of uses and Congress keeps improving this vehicle and supporting it. Now, 529 plans offer flexibility. This is why I like 529 college savings plans and most of our Baird clients invest in 529 college savings plans because of the flexibility. I'm the owner of the 529 account. So I always like to use myself as an example. I'm the parent and uh, I have control over the assets. So what's going in, what's going out. I work with my Baird financial advisor to help me pick the investment solutions and funds that meets my education planning goals and my risk tolerance. And my children don't even have to know that I have a 529 college savings plan saved for them. Grandma and grandpa can have another 529 college savings plan that I don't even have to know about or you know, their grandchildren don't have to know about. So there's a lot of control over this. I can change the beneficiary. This is where the flexibility comes into. So uh, my first child, wishful thinking here, but say he gets a full ride scholarship, right? And he doesn't need the 529 college savings plan. Well, my younger child, you know, he's gonna need it. He's gonna need it for his education. I can change the beneficiary or transfer part of the money from my son, my oldest son, to my youngest son. You can do that tax and penalty free as many times, anytime that is needed. And as long as it's a family member, you can change the beneficiary and really set this up and pass it down to the next generation. So I could already be saving for my future grandchildren, which is a scary thought because my children are still young. But as parents, we always like to plan ahead, right? Worst case scenario, you could take a non-qualified withdrawal. What does that mean? So your principal, your contributions that you've been saving over the years is never taxed or penalized. Just the growth, the earnings in the account is treated as ordinary income and taxable to your tax bracket or the beneficiary's tax bracket. There's a strategy there. Um, and the earnings portion is assessed a 10% penalty. So if I have $20,000 in my account, that's my account value, $15,000 is my principal, is my contributions that I've been putting in over the years, $5,000 of it is growth. I take a full withdrawal. Only the $5,000 is hit with tax and penalty. So not, not a worst case scenario, right? So again, there's flexibility in this 529 college savings plan. Now, this is another one of my favorite slides, debunking 529 minutes. I wish we could have an uh, interactive you know, um, you know, quiz going on here, uh, kind of like Jeopardy, but we can't do that here virtually. So let's go over these myths. So, and you may find this on the internet as well. Myth number one, if my child gets a full ride, I lose all the money in my account. So we know that's false because we just, we just talked about it. So it's only the growth portion that's taxed and penalized. Myth number two, I can only invest in my home state's 529 plan or use my 529 funds at an in-state school. Now don't get, confu get confused with the prepaid 529 plan. The 529 college savings plan can be used in state or out of state. You do not have to invest in your state's plan, but you do want to work with your Baird financial advisor to make sure that you're getting a state tax benefit. 
And sometimes the, the state plan just maybe doesn't have good performance, great customer service, or maybe the fees um, are a little bit too high. So maybe an out of state plan is beneficial. So that's where we really need um, investment professional advice to really help us pick the best 529 that fits our family needs. All right, I have two more. Myth number three, my income is too high to contribute to a 529 account. Again, as I mentioned earlier, there are no income limitations, unlike a covered L, right? Or a Roth IRA. So anyone can contribute to a 529. You do not have to be the owner. You can contribute to someone else's 529 because there is no income limitations. I can only use my 529 funds to pay for tuition. We know that's false. You can use it for room and board, computer technology. And as I mentioned earlier, Congress is supporting this vehicle because they keep enhancing it. How the pandemic may impact your college experience and education plan going forward. So this is a hot topic right now. We really have to think about how is the pandemic impacting us now? How will it change in the future? How will these proposals that are coming out from Washington, D.C. going to be impacting my family's situation now and in the future? So let's talk about virtual learning. So if you're like me last year about this time, I was a, uh, a, a co-worker. I was a wife, I was a mom, and I was a teacher all at the same time. A little overwhelming, right? We can all relate to that. Uh, luckily this year, you know, in our uh, school district here in Wisconsin, my kids have been face to face for di for day one. Um, everyone learns a little bit differently. Lurcher, lurcher, uh, learning, excuse me, can be good for some. Maybe some that are, you know, disabled, um, they have a little bit more advantage learning home virtually. Other students, they need that face to face interaction. They need, um, you know, the the face-to-face -face interaction with different mentors and different teachers, right? Now, what will colleges look like in the future? A lot, I've been reading a lot of articles and, and looking at college websites, and we're learning that, you know what, I think they're gonna continue with an option of having the virtual learning. What does that mean for you? Maybe you won't have to save for room and board as much as, as you've been planning for, but you know what, I still recommend saving because there's gonna be other costs that we're gonna to have to cover like tuition, computer technology. Maybe you have to enhance your computer technology. If you have a student that's in you know, K through 12, um, maybe that's more of a hybrid option, but just things to think about and be aware of. Now let's move on. Due to the CARES Act, uh, currently right now, there's a, a, a payment pause and interest waiver on federal student loans. So what does that mean? If you um, have a federal student loan right now, you don't have to make payments and there's no interest accruing. And now we have a final end date. They kept extending it September 30th, 2021, unless they extend it again. We don't know. I don't foresee that, but I don't have a crystal ball. So what does that mean again for you? Starting September 30th, you're going to have to start paying back those federal student loans and interest will start accruing. So Bear is recommending, look at your budget, plan ahead. If your budget allows it, continue to make payments during this forbearance, basically, not forgiveness, but forbearance, or kind of be prepared starting September 30th to start paying back those federal student loans. Now, the Consolidated Pro Appropriations Act of 2021. Two things came from this act. Number one, they extended the employer payment of student loans through 2025. So um, employers actually could get, get a tax benefit if they're helping their employees pay back their student loan. So this is a benefit employees, it tracks employees to the employer. The employer gets a state, um, I'm sorry, tax benefit. So they did extend it through 2025. Another thing that came out from this act is the FAFSA Simplification Act effective coming up in the 2023-2024 year. FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. So every year it is recommended that you apply for federal aid. Even if you think you make too much money, you think you won't qualify, it's free. You never know what you're going to get until you apply. Federal aid is in the form of uh, work study, 
uh, student loans, and then also grants. So free money versus money you have to pay back. The Simplification Act, they're simplifying the process, making it easier for parents and students to apply. So we're trying to make it easier for, for everyone. I've heard from a few clients that, you know what, it's like filling out your taxes. It's so intrusive, it's so long. So hopefully this is gonna help with that. Now, always be thinking about your college saving strategy. Stay the course. Even with these proposals coming out, which we'll talk into the next slide, there's still a need to save for, for college planning and I'll explain why. Review your college savings plan. I really recommend reviewing it at least once a year with your Baird Financial Advisor or an investment professional. Review your investment strategy and performance, okay? Things change, right? Income, your income could change. Um, you could have a new baby, a new grandchild. So family circumstances change. So it's really good to do an annual review. And I actually do it for my family as well. So I go in my account and I look at it and am I invested where I need to be invested? Am I saving as much as I need to save? Um, you know, my husband and I, we, ch we chose to do a monthly contribution, but then when our budget allows it, we put in a lump sum just to kind of accelerate that savings. And just, just so you know, also the minimum to invest in most 529 plans is as little as $25. And um, so, and you don't have to keep a, a certain minimum really once after you invest in it. All right, let's talk about that, how the new Biden administration may impact in your education plan. So what is the future of 529 plans? Again, I keep saying that 529 plans have continued to have strong support by Congress. Congress, uh, new legislation continues to improve 529s by adding onto the list of what is considered qualified education expense. Uh, my example earlier is they allowed computer technology. I can't believe, you know, even five years ago, they didn't really uh, allow you to spend your 529 assets down on computer technology, such as like a laptop, um, you know, a mouse, things that you really need to go to college. 529 assets continue to grow. And I'm gonna look over to my other screen here to give you some stats here. Um, and uh, just preview that, you know, people are contributing to these 529s and assets are continuing to grow. As of June, 2020, there were 14.7 million accounts invested, totaling 373 billion assets in 529 savings and prepaid plans. And I do check this number year to year, and it has been increasing since I've been in the industry for over 13 years. And then even here at Baird, um, I monitor our sales and assets, and our accounts keep going up every year, our assets keep going up. So people, parents, grandparents are contributing to these 529 college savings accounts. All right, so let's talk about the promises of student loan forgiveness and free tuition. So there's several proposals floating around. Uh, for example, uh, Biden uh, earlier um, during the election, he was promising that he could forgive up to $50,000 for all federal student loan borrows. So not private, but federal student loan borrows. And that, that takes a lot of, a, that's a big chunk of money from uh, the government. That's, that's a big budget for them. And then there was a new proposal coming out saying, okay, well, now we can forgive up to $10,000 per federal student loan borrower. Now, again, these are all promises or proposals, so nothing has been enacted, nothing has been made into law just yet. Reality is, it's very likely that all loans can be forgiven, and there's many questions. Who's eligible? Is there going to be some income limitations? Um, you know, are they be able to forgive everyone? Uh, what is the dollar amount? What is the budget? Who's going to pay for this? There's still many questions and kinks that they really have to work out yet. Bottom line is there's still a need to save for education. You can't plan on the government forgiving all your student loan debt. And what about those students that did pay off their federal student loans and, and created a budget and worked hard to make those payments? Now let's talk about free tuition. I'm gonna, again, go over to my other screen here and read word for word. Um, and I'm gonna step back a little bit here. So there's another proposal from Biden that included free tuition at public college and universities up to four years for families with income below $125,000 per year. 
Now, more recently, there's another proposal said to provide two years of free community college tuition and fees for first time college students and for workers wanting to reskill. All right, so just to keep, keep in mind, and it's really hard to keep track of all this because they're coming out. It feels like, you know, Chris, you could probably agree with me proposals every day and you're on top of this probably more on the bigger level more than I am. And here I focus more just on education planning. And again, if there's any questions, Chris and I would be more than happy to answer at the end of this call. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions that you're, that's popping up in your head. Please don't be afraid to ask in the chat box. All right, here's some more stats. When student loan debt holds you back. So the US currently has a student loan debt of $1.7 trillion. That's trillion. When I learned about that number, I was like, trillion? Do they have that wrong? Is it billion? And it keeps going up. So when I first started in the industry, I remember it was around uh, 1.2, then it, it kept increasing to 1.4. So there is a student loan debt crisis. It's actually known as a, a debt crisis. 31% of students worry most about their student loan debt compared to other financial obligations like paying off their car, or paying off their mortgages. That's a big percentage. 22% of students were delayed by at least two years in moving out of a family member's home after college. So again, I'm, I'm thinking of myself, you know, I hope my, my ch I love my children, I love my boys, but I hope they're not 30 years old living with my husband and I, you know? We wanna go travel, we wanna have our own lives too. Of course, after college, I want them to come home and pop in. If they need a place to stay, they're more than welcome. But, but hopefully their student loan debt isn't gonna delay them from buying a home themselves. Among non-homeowners, 83% cite student loan debt as the factor of delaying from buying a home. Financial aid. So now we're gonna transition and talk more directly about financial aid. And there's actually two application processes depending on what, what the college um, chooses to do. So basically most colleges that you're thinking of, your, your public institutions, your typical four-year colleges like UW-Madison, UW-Whitewater is gonna use the free application for federal student aid. What is that? Um, that's going to be um, a way to apply for aid uh, based on your family uh, finances, basically the parents income and assets and the students income and assets. And they come up with this magical number of how much aid they can give out. And that is in the form of loans, grants and work study programs. Again, the FAFSA is free. You can apply up to 10 schools using one application. So they do make it simple for you and you can apply to multiple and each college application will come back with a different number because each cost um, each college costs a different um, expense. Uh, the filing date is October 1st and then Chris is going to talk more about the financial aid process and the the deadlines coming up. And you don't have to report your primary home as an asset. So they do look at like your income and assets that you own and your students income and assets, but your home, you don't have to report. Now, if you look to the right of your screen, the CSS profile, that's only at your private colleges. So there's about 200, 250 colleges that participate in the CSS profile. It is a little more intrusive. You do have to provide more financial information on this application. There is a fee, so it's not free. Uh, you have to pay $25 for each school that you apply for, except additional schools is $16. I think it's 15 now. I think they reduced the, the cost there. Um, you can apply to as many schools that you're willing to pay for, that you can afford. It's only participating private schools, same filing date, and it does dive deeper into your financials. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, you know, again, for the FAFSA, apply. You don't know what you're gonna get until you apply, it's free. All right, qualifying for financial aid. I apologize, I know this is a, a really big chart with really, really small print. Um, don't worry about squinting your eyes or zooming in. You know, this is just gonna give you a general idea how they assess your financial situation and what they call is the expected family contribution. And I think they changed it to your, the student um, aid index. So same thing really. 
So what they want to come up with is what your family is expected to pay for college and what the college can give you in the form of grants, loans, and uh, work study programs. The biggest impact is going to be the parents' income. Can't really control, uh, you know, how much you make year to year. So that's going to be the biggest impact. They do look at your students' income. Usually, students an eighteen year old has a part time job really isn't making a lot of income. So you shouldn't really have to worry about the student's income. Assets that you own, you do um, not have to report uh, your retirement accounts. That's a good thing. So that does not gonna uh, negatively impact your financial aid uh, package. You, have to, you do not have to report retirement accounts, um, family owned businesses, ABLE accounts, insurance policies, annuities, uh, UTMA accounts that's underneath your name, not the child. Assets that do have to report it, yes, you do have to report your 529 college savings plan, but it's only assessed at 5.6%. So again, if you have a $100,000 529 account, only 5,600 is gonna be counted towards your expected family contribution, reducing your financial aid package by a minimum. Students, this is where you really have to be aware. Any assets that are held in the student's name is assessed at 20%. That should be counted towards your expected family contribution. So UTMAs, you have to be very careful with UTMAs or any trust that's in the student's name. Maybe spend down those assets prior to applying for the financial aid application. Um, securities, stocks, uh, maybe put in the parent's name instead of the student's. So there's some, some, some financial strategy you can kind of think about ahead um, before you apply. Now, Again, with the um, Consolidated Appropriations Act, another thing that came out of that act is uh, grandparent-owned 529 accounts prior to this act. So say if I was a grandparent, I saved over the years, I have $20,000, I want to pay for my grandchild's freshman year of tuition, the whole shebang, $20,000. All right, that's great news, but that counted as income or aid to the student. So when you're applying for a future financial aid package, they do a prior prior year look back at your income, and that would affect the, the student's financial aid package as much as 50%. So that $20,000, $10,000 would be counted towards your expected family contribution. Not a good thing. Finally, Congress came out and said, you know what? Grandparent-owned 529 accounts are not going to be reported on the FAFSA, and if you start using the money to pay for college directly for, example, your grandchild, it's not going to impact the income of the student. Great, great news. Everyone in the 529 industry cheered when that came out. So, again, maybe save in the grandparent name, you know, versus the parent. So, that's something to think about. All right, financial aid strategies tips. Uh, file early. There's only so much aid that each school can give out. The earlier you apply, the earlier you can get back and, and kind of figure out what the cost of college could be for you and your family. Save money in the parent's name, possibly not the child's if you can prevent it. Grandparent-owned 529s do not affect financial aid, so something to remember there. Maximize contributions in your retirement fund. Again, you don't have to report any of your retirement accounts on the FAFSA. So maybe kind of put more money into your retirement fund. Don't rain your retirement funds and minimize your capital gains. Again, you can talk to your Bayer Financial Advisor to work things out. Uh, we are here to help. And with that, you know, that wraps up my presentation. I hope. There's a few things, there's a few key takeaways that you can take back and talk to your family about this. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris, our senior financial planner. He's going to take it from here. And again, please, if you have any questions, uh, fill up our chat box. We'd be happy to help. Great. Thank you, Jeanette. It's always a pleasure to hear you present. I know I learn something new every time. I believe in 529s. Uh, I'm grateful that. I have one. My wife and I opened one years ago and have been funding it. My oldest daughter just turned 18. And so we've been getting this flood in the mailbox from all these colleges that you know, are hoping to catch her attention uh, local and, and you know, farther away across the nation. And so it's, it's just it's a good feeling to know that uh, that we have that in place. Um, 
also just want to call out uh, your expertise. I know I've turned to you over the years uh, with questions. We'll continue to do so specifically about 529 and education funding. So my comments will be, as you alluded, you know, broader and more about general financial planning. Um, specifically, what I want to make sure everybody's aware of is that here at Baird, our financial planners, our financial advisors have the ability to do specific college funding analysis with you. So one of the things that I get to enjoy um, being a senior financial planner here, I cover the whole West Coast, I get to see hundreds of these plans run. And I've seen a lot of value added for folks who want to answer some questions, some tough questions. Um, and some of those questions are, you know, how much should I fund um, into college education for my child or my grandchild? You know, if I'm going to use a 529, how much money do I really need to put in there? And so we subscribe to a database that pulls in all of the current information from colleges that they submit on their costs. So if you know whether it's going to be a private or public or even a specific college, we can pull in those costs and run an analysis and project how much coverage of the cost do you already have or how much would you need to save on a recurring basis to meet that. And then also answer other questions, the question of, you know, should I divert some of my retirement savings? You know, I'm putting in X dollars every year into a retirement account, but I also want to help my child get ready for college. So how many dollars should I save versus for my retirement? I remember uh, in studying the material for, you know, over a decade ago for becoming a certified financial planner, something that really stuck out to me is that the greatest financial gift that you can give your children is to never have to ask them for money. So you want to make sure, of course, that you balance your approach on how much to retirement, how much to help uh, your college bound children or grandchildren. Another question that we can answer with other software tools that we have where we can take your college funding question and insert it into your overall financial picture is to help answer the question, what looks better for me long term? You know, what if I you know, take $3,000 that I'm putting away for this boat goal that I have versus into the 529? And so we can answer those questions with certainty and with actual dollar amounts. So we have several software tools that allow us to do that for you. And your financial advisor has access to those and, and we'd be happy to help. The last thing I want to talk about briefly is a little bit more about what Annette alluded, uh, Jeanette alluded to about the Biden administration and the proposals that have come about. And specifically, one that you may be very familiar with, the American Rescue Plan Act that Biden signed into effect on the 11th of March of this year. And the reason you're probably familiar with this one is because this is the one that really has gotten a lot of headlines and in the news because this is where the third round of COVID stimulus checks came from. So if you look at this bar chart that I have in front of us, you'll see there's a lot of slices to this pie. Um, the one that I'm referring to is at the bottom, that dark red color is the largest portion of the stimulus package. $1.9 trillion has been authorized to be funded into these various categories. And again, the one we're most familiar with, the largest one is, are, are those stimulus checks where many Americans receive $1,400. For our purposes today, I wanna focus right there in the middle on that pink section where it shows that $176 billion was provided for education. Uh, that hasn't, I think, received as much headlines or as many headlines um, as other categories. So let's talk about that. Of the 176, $40 billion, this is already signed and done. So $40 billion is being provided for colleges and students. And the mechanism that's being used is uh, a fund that was created, it's called the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund. It's a mouthful. On the internet, you'll find it referred to as HERF, uh, for better or worse. Um, that is where the money is sitting um, that was authorized by this American Rescue Plan Act. And this is how the money is supposed to be used. According to the literature, according to the legislation, is to be split among a number of categories. And I have not listed them all here. It, the list is pretty long, but here's some of them. Um, the money is supposed to be used to address learning loss for underserved students. It's supposed to be used to target 
high impact tutoring and also extend learning times. Now, exactly what do those mean? I don't know, and it's actually a big question mark for a lot of people. I'm sure it'll be debated for years on whether these funds were used appropriately or not um, in these different categories and, and really what these categories truly mean. The one I wanna focus on for the next minute is the last one there I've underlined, emergency student aid. So a big portion of the 40 billion is supposed to go to emergency student aid. And that's the one that really matters to you folks who are listening today because it means that there is extra money on the table being made available to students. And if you go to the US Department of Education website, you can actually find what those allocations are. Um, so specifically, I looked up a couple that I thought were interesting. Uh, the University of Wisconsin at Madison is set to receive $27 million. Um, if you're more interested in the Wisconsin campus, they're set to receive 25. And then I had to put on the screen as well, my own alma mater, University of Washington here at Seattle, they're gonna receive $52 million. So the natural question is, okay, well, how do we get that money? How do the students get that money? And it's really already what Jeanette has short, shared with us. You've gotta fill out the FAFSA. So there's a few ways to do that. Um, I have here a couple of the icons that you would find on your smartphone. So the one on the left bottom there, that is the Federal Student Aid app or an Android phone that you can download and you can fill out your FAFSA form that way. Right, I'm, I'm thinking of the students and my 18 year old, she'd rather probably do it on her smartphone than on the, on the computer. Uh, the, the iPhone app is there in the middle on the bottom. This says federal student aid on it, very similar in look. It's the app you can use to apply for FAFSA. Now, if you wanna just use the regular old internet, you can go to studentaid.gov and you can fill out the FAFSA form there. I really like going to studentaid.gov because I think it's easier to see on a larger screen. And also, I really recommend at least going to that website so that you can find the other deadlines. Um, because I have listed here for you the federal deadline, which is a timely piece of information because it's next month. So like Jeanette taught us, FAFSA opens in October, but the federal deadline is June 30th. So that's just next month. So don't miss that. If, um, if you are, you know, if this is for you or for a family member, make sure that you've, you've done your FAFSA. If you haven't, you've got till next month to do it, June 30th. So again, the other deadlines I'm referring to at studentaid.gov are state deadlines. So you can, it's right there towards the front page, you can click on other deadlines and you'll find listed for each state of the nation what their state deadline is because some of them actually shift a little bit before or after June 30th. Um, and just for those who are listening who, you know, um, piqued their attention when I was mentioning uh, Wisconsin or Washington, both those states actually say that you need to just go ahead and talk to your local university financial aid representative and they would give you more details. So not all the states there list a um, hard and fast deadline, but many of them do. So again, in summary, go to studentaid.gov, apply, do the FAFSA form, but also look at the other deadlines, talk to your university and do everything you can in your power to give yourself a shot at these funds. Um, it is needs-based, but you'll never know until you actually go for that. Um, you're gonna have a hard time finding the answer to your question of, well, how much money can I get? Um, scouring the internet, some of the universities, some colleges have taken a stab at showing, okay, if you're a standard student with standard income and you kind of have an average family, the, I, these are the figures I saw, you know, anywhere from $900 to 1,300 to 1,700. Um, but none of them, of course, said that that's going to be the amount. You'll never know until you actually fill out the FAFSA and get that done. So that concludes the information that I had for us today. Uh, make sure you reach out to your financial advisor at Baird to go over those planning tools and run an analysis for you and your family on your education funding. And I'm sure that it will um, help you feel better or help you know where to take the next steps that will make things better for you and your family. So with that, um, before we get into the question and answer period, I'll turn the time back over to Kelsey to help explain how to do that. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Jeanette, as well as Chris, for your comments. 
Well, I'll give you just a, a quick moment to catch your breath. I want to remind everyone that you can ask a question through the Q&A box on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Simply click, click the Q&A button, type in your question and assign it to all panelists. We see some great ones coming in. And so Jeanette, I might have you kick off with the first one. Great, sounds good. I see a lot of questions. This is awesome. So everyone's engaged and listening. No one has fallen asleep. <laughs> so I'm going to address a few questions as many as I can. If I don't get to it, please read out, reach out to your Baird Financial Advisor. They can work with either Chris or myself and we can get those questions answered. Um, homeschooling question. So there is a question out there. Can I use 529 funds to pay towards homeschooling? Now homeschooling, not virtual learning, that's different. Homeschooling is not through like the public or private system. It's a whole different system. You cannot use 529 money tax and penalty free to pay for homeschooling. You can pull it out, but you're going to have to report it and pay taxes and penalties on the growth portion of the withdrawal. So as of right now, they were going to put it in uh, a bill and they took it out. So you cannot use it for homeschooling. Uh, living off campus. So say if my student is living off campus, uh, either at home or uh, living in an apartment, not on campus. Can I use my 529 money to pay towards room and rent? Yes, room and rent. What that really means is uh, room and board. I apologize is rent and food. Uh, so you can kind of figure out a budget, a monthly budget of how much food you're spending, either at the grocery store, keep track of it in an Excel spreadsheet, uh, how much rent you're paying, but there's a limit. The IRS said you can only withdraw up to the dollar amount that the school estimates for the cost of room and board. Where do you get that? Every school has a cost of attendance on their website. So just take a look at it. They have to have it out there for financial aid purposes and look at the total cost for the year and make sure you don't withdraw too much um, and it's within that limit. So yes, you can use it for off-campus living. There's another question out there uh, you know, I'm saving for K through 12 education and higher education. How do I do that in my 529? There's so many different strategies. You can actually have two separate 529 accounts, one earmarked for K through 12 because you maybe want to be in, invested in a different share class or a different investment option because your time horizon and your risk is different compared to saving for higher education. So you could have two 529 accounts for the same beneficiary or you can have one 529 account with two different investment options in there. And there's calculators like Chris uh, talked about earlier that we could run for you. We can use um, a savingforcollege.com um, calculator or also our Money Guide Pro tool. The Baird Financial Advisors can, can run that and we can figure that out. Uh, FAFSA um, assets. So, there's a, a little confusion about the FAFSA. So when you apply that day of, you have to report the account value, the assets as of that day. So if you have a retirement account, an IRA, remember you don't have to report that. So you could kind of continue contributing to that retirement or IRA and move some money around if that fits your need. Um, the uh, income, they do a prior, prior look back. So remember, if you're applying for this upcoming school year, which is the 2021-2022 school year, you have to report your 2019 income. And there's an IRS retrieval tool online, like Chris mentioned, probably the easiest is use the app or go to studentaid.gov and do the online application and use that IRS retrieval pool tool because it will pull in your income statements, basically your, your tax statements rather, for you. Um, trying to think, uh, what else, Kelsey? I know there's lots of questions that are coming in. What else can I focus on here? And these are all really great questions. Yeah, when I see, um, can the 529 be used for a parent or just a child? And, and so how would that work if, if a parent actually wants to go back to school? Can they leverage those funds as well? Good question. So. Uh, you, the, the adult, the parent, you can open up your own 529 account. So I can name myself as the owner and myself as the beneficiary, get that tax deferred growth, put money in it. Maybe I'll get a state tax benefit if I live in one of those states that have a state tax benefit. I decide to go back to graduate school or take a cooking class. 
I can pull that money out for myself tax and penalty free. Then I decide, you know what? I didn't use all the funds. I didn't need all this money. Again, you can pass it down onto the next generation, change the beneficiary as long as it's a family member. You can do that tax and penalty free. And I hope that answered the question. Kelsey, do you see any other? We have a little bit of time. Looks like we have about five minutes left. Um, uh, Chris, yeah, let's hit yeah. a couple more yeah. if, you, if you don't mind. Oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead first. Oh, I was just going to add a little flavor to, um, you know, Jeanette's response there because some of the questions were about, you know, using these tools. And I just want to be clear that we can use the tools to customize to your situation. So um, we can go ahead and make an assumption about scholarships and we can make an assumption about there not being scholarships and we can run it both ways. So we can pretend that your child gets all the sports scholarships in the world or academic scholarships in the world. And then how much would you need to save by while subtracting out that amount? But then also we can run it the other way too. So, because one of the questions here is, you know, can you make assumptions about the analysis with scholarships? And the answer is absolutely yes. We can run it every which way you can think of and give you an answer. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, Jeanette, I think this one might come back to you. Um, can you clarify, so if a grandparent opens a 529 for their grandchild, is that factored into the FAFSA format and what they need to claim from a, a fund standpoint that they currently have? It is not factored in the FAFSA at all. So let me clarify, because this is a new, new concept and strategy that came out. So grandparent owned 529 accounts, and I use that as an example. So all non-parent own 529 accounts. So aunt or uncle or a friend of the family owns this 529 account. That is an asset of that particular owner, not the child, right? So that is not reported on the FAFSA. So there is not a question that says, do you have a 529 account for a grandparent or an aunt and uncle? You do not report that. And additionally, when that non-parent, that grandparent, that aunt and uncle takes money out of the account, to pay for your child's tuition, room and board, it does not impact your financial aid package in the future because it no longer counts as income to the student. So again, a strategy could be is to maybe save it in a non-parent, um, uh, you know, non-parent, uncle or grandparent, as long as you trust them, um, you have to talk about, you know, the family circumstances and situation because they own the assets. It doesn't have to go towards the child. That's usually why, for myself, the parent, I like to have control over the account. So it's a very important concept. It's a new concept. Uh, you may not find it on the internet. Um, so feel free to to reach out to uh, any of us, and you know we can kind of talk more about that. I, I hope that answered the question. Excellent. I, I see. Maybe we'll hit one more, depending on the response and the other ones. We can certainly follow up with. Um, this one is uh, regarding just aid in general. And so is there a level of income that shuts you out of receiving receiving aid that should be that, considered? Yeah, and Chris, you can chime in too after you know I give my little answer here. That's yeah. a tough question. So you'll look on the internet and you know, is there an income cap? No, not really, because it is based on need-based aid. But again, you know, uh, there's um, data out there that says if you make more than $250,000, you probably won't get need-based aid. But again, it, it depends on the assets and income too. So, and the family situation, are both students in college? Um, do you have one student in college, one out? Uh, divorce situations, um, you know, they look at the assets, yeah. who, which parent you're living with, the the most more more than 50 percent of the time so there's so many different family circumstances that there is no set number um so again but i've seen around two hundred fifty thousand dollars if you make more than that as a family um you probably won't get as much or any need-based aid but there's still student loans that money that you have to pay back there's other scholarships that's more merit-based not need-based out there so scholarships going to really affect your financial aid application uh, or your financial aid um, 
package, it really all depends. So again, you have to separate the two. There's need-based and there's merit-based. I always encourage to go get free money, right? Grants, scholarships, do the research. We actually have a lot of client client friendly pieces that we can pass along if you ask your Baird financial advisor that we have um, all the tools and resources and websites to do the scholarship searches. So you don't have to do the research for you because there is a ton out there. College coaches out there that you can pay money for. I was talking to a Baird associate. She pays about $10,000 a year. I'm like, oh gosh, why are you doing that? We have all the resources here for you. Um, you know, so she's like, well, maybe for my second child, <laughs> I'll think about that. You know, if you do a little bit of research, it, it, it probably will save you a lot of money. One thing that I would add is that my understanding is that the timing of your application can matter as well, not just what your income is. So some colleges and universities, I mean, a lot of them use the FAFSA for their own decisions on their own university level. Um, scholarships, whether they're merit based um, or needs based. And so, you know, one family who may have the exact same financial situation as another, their child may actually get some help when the other one doesn't simply because, you know, they applied two months later and and all of what was available had been used up by them. That's a really good point, Chris. That's it. Well, thank you both so much. We are at time and I want to be conscious of that. I, I see a couple of questions really looking at the planning situation, risk and reward. And so I would encourage you certainly to reach out to your financial advisor and as, as both Jeanette and Chris mentioned, they can run some risk analysis, but that they're a great place to start with this dialogue and, and to really make sure um, your best interests are, are what they're planning for. I'll also say, um, if you enjoyed today's presentation, want to share it with a friend, family member, or even review it, um, we will have a recording available in about a week through your financial advisor. Um, so stay tuned for that. And we'd also like, we'd also invite you to join next month's webinar, which will be focused around tax planning um, and try to make sense of uh, all the new proposals that are coming out. And so look for an invite or reach out to your financial advisor and they can get you an invite to that webinar as well. As always, thank you so much for joining. We appreciate your time, Jeanette and Chris, really appreciate your expertise here today. Um, and everyone have a wonderful afternoon.